Yeah, you get the point. Programming can be very fun and useful if you do it the right way, but a lot of people end up quitting early because they start off like this. Also use a negative index. So let me teach you the fun way to learn programming. I'd say that the best starting point for everybody would be Python and then after that you can specialize on whatever you want. Just look a Python tutorial on YouTube or find a website and pick whichever one is least annoying to you because they all pretty much teach you the same thing. For now you're gonna learn basic syntax and basic programming. If you wanna do it properly, don't just blindly follow whatever they do in the tutorial, you need to do three very important things. Experiment with the code and understand what you're actually writing. Make your own small projects that you actually enjoy working on and make sure that the way you're doing it is the best way to do it before you move forward. First you're gonna need something to write your code. In. I would recommend VS Code. I'm not going to show you how to set that up because you don't have the attention span and it's easy anyway. And I will show you how to follow the first rule. During this video, don't focus on the code itself, just the general methods that I'm explaining. So let's say I'm watching a tutorial and the YouTuber tells me that the function input takes user input and then I can use it however I want. In the example, he takes age as an input and then prints out this is your age. Pretty simple, but then the YouTuber moves on. You might not really understand what the function does if you stop there, so you might want to experiment. Here's how you do it. First, I take the function and then I try to print it out. I can see that if I press enter and I don't input anything, I don't get any output. But if I type something in, I get that exact same thing printed out. So basically whatever I type goes inside of input. Now this part is starting to make a bit more sense. Whatever I type into input gets put into age and then age gets printed. But then that also tells me that I don't need the age variable, I can just put the input straight inside of the print. Another interesting feature is that it stalls all of my code until I get rid of the input by pressing enter. So basically this code down here will only execute if I press enter. So then we have Larry. He was building his temple but he could couldn't really see very well so he couldn't put the star on top of the temple. I need to find the exact coordinates to tell him where to put the star or it's just gonna fall off and he's gonna be very sad. I'll use Win32 API to get my cursor position but if I run it normally it's just gonna tell me where my cursor is when I'm on my VS code. This doesn't help Larry in any way. But then I remembered I can just stall the code with input, I can move my mouse on top of where he needs to put the star and then I can get him the coordinates by just pressing enter because it makes my code run. Look at how happy Larry is now. Obviously that's not the best way to stall code but I was just showing you how to explore something new. So now that I experimented with the function a bit, I understand it better. Now I want to personalize it and make a small project out of it. Because this one is very basic, I don't feel like making a whole project out of it, so I'm just gonna customize it for now. In my case, I'm just gonna use YouTubers instead of age. And now the last step is to make sure that I do it properly. Throughout this video, I've been printing out strings wrong, because this is usually how beginners learn them, by just adding strings together. The way you're actually supposed to do it is by using string formatting, and that would look something like this. Which leads me to the next point. How do you know how to do it properly? Well, honestly, just use AI. AI is basically just a personal teacher for you that's there to guide you throughout everything. Anyone that tells you that AI is bad for learning in this context is objectively wrong. Yes, it is bad to heavily rely on AI and make it make entire projects for you and not learn anything, obviously, but if you're just giving it a few errors, if you're making it explain to you why your code doesn't work or if there's a better way to do it, it's an incredibly valuable tool and I think everyone should be using it. Now let me give you a bit of a better example for the second rule. Let's take an array. An array is just kind of a list of items that all have a certain slot. And and then you can just find the item by the slot. Usually in tutorials they use fruit or names as examples. But let's make this more fun and personal. Let's say I want to play Valorant and I want my script to decide a random character for me to play. Well I can just fill out an array with every character name and instead of doing it manually I can just save some time and tell ChatGPT to make me the array. So now if I ask for the agent at index 2 it's gonna look 0, 1, 2 and it should be Omen. There it is. Now how do I randomize it? Well I need to find some sort of a random number generator so I'm gonna look up how to generate a random number in Python. I found out that I can use the random module. Now I'm gonna make it generate a random number between 1 and 27, in this case between 0 and 26 because array start at 0, and then it's just gonna print out the character at that position in the array, pretty much picking me a random character. I think that's a pretty cool project. And also in the process I learned how arrays work better and I learned how to generate random numbers, and throughout time you're gonna learn a lot of different stuff by doing these sorts of small projects, and the more complex the project the more you're gonna learn. Learning the basics should only take you a few days to a week, so it shouldn't be that bad, and then after that you get to start having fun because you can do whatever project you want. I didn't only tell you to start with Python because it's the easiest to learn, but also it's extremely versatile so you can do pretty much anything with it. It's also going to help you a lot in the future whenever you want to make a custom tool that doesn't exist or you want to automate some tasks because it's so easy to do with Python. When it comes to languages, people worry about this way too much in the beginning, it really doesn't matter. The most important thing is that you learn to program properly and then you can hop between languages very easily. Once you learn to program, it's easy to learn a new language and it's a lot faster than learning your first language. In fact, developers pick up new languages all the time if 
it's the most suitable for the project that they're working on. Except me, I'm not touching Java. And now let's talk about cool projects. Until now, we pretty much just dealt with strings and static values in the code. We didn't really get external information. Like we didn't interact with any apps or websites or anything interesting. Now it's time to spice it up and interact with external platforms. There's three main ways to do this. Let's say you're playing an online multiplayer game and you have matches with other players. The game provider tracks those games and keeps them stored on a database. The company's not going to give you direct access to their database for obvious reasons, but they are going to provide an API that lets you interact with it. This means that you can pull and manipulate whatever relevant information you want in your program. This can be done with many services, not just games, but I'm going to use League as an example for now. In this case, I'm going to make an account and get an API key that allows me to interact with the API. First, I'm going to get the player identifier by giving it the in-game tag. Afterwards, I can look for the player's match history data with the PUUID that I just got. Then I can get the match data by the match ID that I just pulled from the match history. And now I have all of the match data for that game. The API looks something like this, but then I can take specific values and modify it with some front end to make it look like this. And there's a lot of sites that do this for many different games. Like here we can see the level, the champion, the number of deaths, and a bunch of things that don't even show up, like how many times they pinged. You can do all of this in Python through request, by the way. Now let's do something a bit more entertaining. I'm going to take a live game and I'm going to use the game API to get me the in-game data. So this is what the API API looks like and it gets me stats like my character stats, for example, my attack damage, my HP, my attack speed and other stuff. I can pull all of those stats through their API and manipulate it however I want in my script. In my case, I'm just going to print it out in the terminal. And now we can see that as my attack speed gets higher in game, it also updates in the terminal. This means that my script currently has active live game data. With this, I could do something like a Discord presence bot, which shows my KDA and my farm in real time as I'm playing a game so that people on Discord can see that. Or I could go the evil route and just make a kiting script out of it, although I can't really show you that on YouTube. There's APIs for all sorts of platforms. It doesn't have to be League or any game for that matter. So if you don't really care about games, you can do it for whatever your interests are. Let's say that you like football. You can just find an API that gets you player data or match data and then make an app that displays it or indexes it. You can also do it externally by scanning the screen or having preset positions and then simulating user input, like your mouse and keyboard actions. This is harder to detect by anti-cheats and it's also useful for quick automation. Here you have to wait for it to turn green and then click it and check your reaction time. First I'm going to make it check a pixel from somewhere around here. If it turns green it's going to have this RGB value so I can just put it in a loop and constantly scan that pixel to see if it reaches that value. If it does I just make it click by simulating my mouse input. This way I only use screen detection and keyboard and mouse manipulation so I don't actually inject into the browser or do any sorts of site requests. It's called a pixel scanner and I do it externally. This was a simple example, but there's much more interesting examples like this one where I just automate an entire game by using the same technique. Pretty much everything that's actively running in a program is stored in memory. This means that if I were to find the memory address for my HP, I could change that however I want. This has limitations because of anti-cheats and other stuff, but that's the general concept of internals. Basically, if you're injecting into a process and you're editing or reading its memory directly, you're doing internals. These are generally used for game cheats. If you're interested in that, I'm going to have a kernel level anti-cheat documentary coming up next month. I also documented some of my Python projects. Earlier, I told you to use ChatGPT for help, but now the projects are getting far too advanced for it to be able to properly help you. Trying to do this through an LLM chat just simply doesn't work at this scale. It wasn't built for that. Luckily today's sponsor came in clutch. Meet Warp 2.0, an agentic development environment where agents actually do the heavy lifting across the entire development lifecycle. It's a top performer on Terminal Bench above Cloud Code and Gemini CLI and scored 71% on SWE Bench Verified, making it one of the highest performing coding agents out there. Warp isn't just another chat window or autocomplete toy. It's built at the right level in the stack. It picks the best model for the job or lets you choose the best model gathers context across repos, plans, summarizes, and then applies fixes directly to files. You can run multiple agents in parallel, manage their autonomy from a clear UI, edit the diffs in-app, and then commit and push without using 20 different apps and LLM chat interfaces. The whole workflow is literally what Warp 2.0 is made for. There's a reason why over 600,000 engineers use Warp. The best part is that they have a free plan and you can easily try it yourself without having to buy anything. If you enjoy it, you can go pro for $15 a month and you can use the code CRIN to get your first month of pro for only $3. If this this sounds good, head over to go.warp.dev slash green and check it out for yourself. The link is also at the top of the description and in the pinned comment. That's pretty much it for people that want to get into programming but don't really care about jobs. Now when it comes to getting a job in programming, here's what you need to do. First of all, get a university degree because it's very useful and the competition will only get higher over time and you're gonna need it. On top of everything that I'm about to say, obviously. If you want more info on that, I also made a whole video on it. Okay, so now that you finished the basics, it's time to pick a field to specialize in and start working on more advanced projects. The reason why you want to specialize on a specific field is 
is because they vary quite a lot in the technologies that they use and the skills that you need. So a low level engineer is probably going to need to know C, memory management, work closely with hardware, understand low level performance, optimization, concurrency, be really good at operating systems and many other things of that sort. Meanwhile, a web developer does the exact opposite and is going to work with a high level language, probably using Python and JavaScript, and they don't really care about hardware or memory and they don't have to optimize it in that way. Instead, they're going to care more about APIs, web protocols, data modeling, optimizations for servers and scaling, networking, device compatibility, and those sorts of things. That's pretty much it for the generic guide, and you're not supposed to get too much guidance because you're supposed to find your own path and think for yourself rather than find a roadmap that's going to work for everybody because it's probably not going to work for everybody. One more tip though is that if you want to start with low level, you need to understand data structures and CS and low level concepts very well before you start working with the language because otherwise there's no reason to use it. And in general, a developer needs to be very good at CS principles and making stuff properly and well optimized. Other than that, you just continue with the project learning method and you find something that you find interesting and you want to work on and then you learn along the way, even if it's very complicated and you don't know where to start. For things that are kind of subfields on their own, like AI for example, you can just take courses on it and then continue rather than just starting from scratch. Now let's go for some guidelines that you need to follow as a programmer. Regardless of how complex the project is, you should still attempt it if it's a project that you want to do and you'll just learn along the way. You shouldn't be scared by the complexity. Don't just use the technology because you're comfortable with it when there's much better alternatives. Like it's a very bad idea to parse a JSON by using strings and then splitting the string instead of just using JSON parsing. And when it comes to AI, once you already learned basic syntax, don't overuse it too much for problem solving or you're gonna become a useless programmer. Also, tutorial hell isn't a real thing. You can just alternate between projects and tutorials and find whichever balance you like. I personally watched about half an hour of tutorials when I got started and then I got bored and I started doing projects. When it comes to projects, get creative and do stuff for the things that you actually use or enjoy. Yeah, you could make macros, automation, cheats or plugins or mods for the games or apps that you enjoy. Or you can even do something a lot more abstract like an encryption app for Discord. You would have a password that would generate an encryption key, you would share the password with your friend and then you would both have the same encryption and decryption key. And from that you can just type in an encrypted way through any communication app. All you really have to do is just get creative and do stuff for the things you like. What I'm trying to tell you is you have so many options when you're looking at projects that you can make and all you have to do is get creative and not be scared just hop in and try to do it from now on it just comes down to you putting in the work and try to have fun in the beginning it's quite important that you have fun or you're gonna get bored and you're gonna drop it very early and there's just no reason to make a fun experience miserable and other than that see you in the next one